Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Don't Mom Alone podcast. I am your host, Heather McFadden, and this is the place where I get to walk alongside you and connect you to people and resources so you know that you don't mom alone. And in this episode, number 338, we get to welcome back our favorite Nashville counselors, David Thomas and Sissy Goff, to help us help our kids find their people. I would say on the flip side of losing friends uh, or losing a friend who may have moved or relocated, as painful as that's going to be to watch and where that may create some hesitancy or even as you shared resistance, use that as opportunity. I mean, I think one of the greater task of parenting is preparing our kids to navigate loss, loss of all kinds, you know, that is inevitable this side of heaven. And so though none of us would script that into the kids we love stories, we have to be about the work of preparing them for loss, loss of friendships, loss of relationships, loss of jobs, loss of people we love in this world, because that loss is universal. It's a universal human experience that none of us can get around. And so I would take advantage of that and just even helping kids develop more of a connection emotionally to what's going on that may be affecting what's going on socially. David and Sissy have each been on the show twice individually and once together. And so we need to have them come back. And this topic, y'all, after I recorded it, I couldn't stop talking about it with my in real life friends. I was like, oh my goodness, just wait till Monday's episode comes out. It's gonna, it's so good. It has changed how I think about so many different things. David Thomas, if you haven't heard his episodes before, please see the ones linked in the show notes. He is our boy expert and Sissy is our girl and anxiety expert. And both of them provide such great perspective on how boys and girls navigate friendships and really as parents what is our role how do we guide our kids and what do we need to focus their attention on it's so good I want to get right to it so here we go David and Sissy welcome back to the Dome Mom Alone podcast we're so happy to be with you oh my gosh y'all everyone is so pumped that you're here to help them with this issue of helping their kids find their people because I think it also brings up a lot from our past and maybe being excluded or I know my mom chose to homeschool me because I was part of the cool girl second grade click and I was excluding people and so then I became the homeschool girl who's excluded which you can read about in chapter four of my book but cannot uh, wait (laughs) cannot wait I think mom's just don't know what their role is. And so, and I know this spans and changes from early years where we do play dates and we're kind of the boss of everything all the way through high school and just feeling like we don't really know what our part is, if it is at all. And so can you start us off? Like what are some overall parameters that would help a mom in this? Can I throw out one idea, Sissy, and then I want to hear what you're thinking. Heather, I would say as we think about the the whole journey of offering support to kids from little bitties all the way through, I have been challenged lately by, I just dropped my twin boys who are my last two kiddos off at college. And when we were at orientation, I had this really interesting experience we did as parents where they handed us all an envelope early into the experience, said, don't open it yet. We'll tell you when and why. And we opened the envelope and there was the sticker inside that said, be a coach, not a fixer. And they asked every parent there to put the sticker on and they asked us to put it on like in the spot of our heart. And then throughout the weekend, when we were tempted to do more intervening than was needed, necessary, or helpful to literally like touch your heart, like (laughs) when you're feeling those tugs happening, when you're in the dorm room and you want to break out the measuring tape and tell them where to put their stuff, as opposed to letting them tell you where they'd like their stuff to be. All these different moments, like touch the sticker, say it out loud, remind yourself to be a coach, not a fixer. And I was so struck by the experience, not just for me personally, but I I think for every parent that if, if we were to operate with that mindset, start to finish, I think there's so much wisdom in that. Like in those moments where you feel like you want to be 
more involved than may be needed, necessary, or helpful, what would it look like to have some kind of mantra like that, that you say back to yourself, that that's the end goal? Like if I'm always a fixer, by the time our kids get into that launching space, like they just don't have the skills in place socially, emotionally, spiritually, like on any level to be able to navigate life in the way we want them to. And so I remember thinking to myself in that moment, I wish they'd handed this envelope out at preschool. I really do. Like, I wish I'd been wearing that sticker (laughs) when my kids were three years of age on with that reminder, framing a lot of how I stepped in and stepped out in, in the journey of parenting. So that's, those are some words I'm working to live by that I want to encourage other parents with, if that's helpful to you. It's very good. Love that. And I'm, and I mean, don't, I mean, if you want to cry about the college thing or. Yeah, we could have a whole session around that right but there. God's gift. I remember when I, last time I saw you in person was pre pandemic and you were thinking about, do I travel less? Yes. I want to spend time with my boys. And then God took care of that. So you, I mean, there's no regret. You probably got more time than you ever expected with them. Oh my goodness. Yes. So much so that I think my wife was ready for me to get on a plane. Like she's like, when are you leaving? (laughs) Why are you home all the time? I almost fell over at that. I almost fell over. Okay. Okay. Sissy, what do you, what do you think? What's the help? Uh, Well, I would say two big picture ideas and you alluded to this one in a beautiful way, Heather, but I think one is it feels really more important to prioritize teaching kids to be a friend than to be concerned with them having friends. Mm. And I think David and I both see parents who lean the other direction. So that would be one. And we can talk about what that looks like. And the second would be, and, and this is because I work with girls and you nailed this too. I mean, I had a mom a couple of weeks ago in my office who was sobbing over her daughter being left out of the homecoming group, sobbing. And I said, how's your daughter doing? And she said, well, she seems to be okay, but I think she's just not really feeling it. And I said, well, I want you to take your cues from her. And and that feels like a bottom line, big picture idea too. Like we can't have more emotion than they do over whatever's going on for them relationally, because often that'll make them either feel like we're not safe to talk to, or it'll just make them dam up those feelings. And so those would be my two big picture ideas starting off. I think that is so true. Oftentimes when a mom will talk to me and they're concerned that their child doesn't have enough friends, I'll say, are they okay? Do they need lots of friends? Because I think we forget that there are different personalities who really prefer one or two very loyal people rather than the crowd. And then there are the kids that love the crowd and they don't want to go deep. And you're making them go deep by inviting the same friend yeah. over all the time. <laughs> like, I, I like variety. Sure, sure. So I think you're right to check in with them and not make what's important to us and important to them or feel like, and this is, I think, a lot of the pressure for some of the moms is they're making a mistake because their child mm-hmm. isn't quote unquote popular. I made a mistake and for your example that they weren't included in the homecoming group, that there's so much mom orchestration that's happening, which is legit. There's a lot of mom orchestration. So then you're like, oh, then I messed up. I mean, I know there were plenty of years where I had lots of little kids and I wasn't doing the play dates and I wasn't making the plans or knowing what everyone was up to. I was just trying to survive. (laughs) And so a lie that I could believe is I have messed up as a mom because I didn't X, Y, and Z. Which is absolutely not true because we see kids who've been included all of those years and all of a sudden aren't. I mean, there's so many variables that go into that. And I would say, it, I mean, probably a great thing to remind yourself in terms of pulling out to be the coach, like David was talking about, is it's just not about me. It's yeah. not my failure and it's not my success either way. Bruce and I are lucky enough that we both enjoy math a lot and most of our kids do as well but we do have one child who has struggled along the way Uh, I know the pandemic was rough for a lot of kids and learning and they have fallen behind for our son he actually caught up during the pandemic but he's still testing a little bit below his grade level in some areas of math so when mathnasium reached out to be a sponsor I was super excited I wanted to check them out and see if they could help us 
fill in the gaps where he needed them. So Mathnasium works mainly with kids in grades two through 12th. And they really are the authority on math education. It's all that they teach and they're experts at it. You can go in center or online. So you can find a place near you. There are over a thousand of them across the country. Now we chose to do his sessions online just so I don't have one more place to go. And what was great is they gave him an assessment to start. He struggled a bit to finish it in the time they had. So they were super kind to give him um, another time to finish it. And the instructors were so patient helping him with any of his nerves, being really calm. And so I was very impressed with that. They also sent me a detailed report that told me where he was above grade level in different math areas and where he was kind of needing an extra boost. And so then the people at Mathnasium, they provide a customized learning plan for exactly what your child needs. And then they can, if they're a little bit behind, they'll bridge the gap. And if they need to move at a faster pace and be challenged, they're gonna step on the gas and raise the level of work. They never assign homework, but they can help your kid with their homework from school. You just scan it in if you're doing it online or bring it to to the in center. And I think that is super helpful too. So they can see what they're learning at school and where they're struggling and kind of help them be a critical thinker. Whether you're looking to get your kids back on track or want to ensure they're staying ahead with their math studies, find a center near you at mathnasium.com. So it's math and then N-A-S-I-U-M.com. Contact them for a free in-center or online consultation. Okay, so let's, let's maybe go through if your child is not included because I think that's the pain point for a lot of people is their child's excluded. What does that coaching look like? How do we help them navigate and maybe not to be included in the most popular group, but how do we help them feel connected to people if that's their desire? Can, can I back up and say something I see happen a lot before and David, then you can give some practical things. But so one of the things that I have noticed over the years is that there is a certain personality of child adolescent that their relationships are based more on their perspective than reality. And their parents will bring them in or call me and say, they're being left out. They're being left out. They're being left out. And I mean, I think I probably had 10 girls in the last five years who those very girls I would have in group counseling sessions. And I mean, it is as literal as I had a girl that was at my house on a Thursday night, came in, she, she's a little quirky, um, but the kids love her, but, but she connects a little bit differently, but I mean, she comes in and they get so excited to see her and they're really responsive to her. And she probably asks more questions than some of the other kids, but it's because she has more depth and she's super intentional. Well, then she leaves and, you know, they're with her like they are with everyone else. And then her mom calls me the next week and said, she said, no one likes her at group. She walks in, no one speaks to her. No one responds to her. And thankfully I could say, let me tell you what I saw. Yeah. And what I realized was that was this girl's experience everywhere she went and what she would report to me. And I would fall for it as the counselor. I totally believed she had no friends at school. And, and so, I mean, I think that is a trap that it's really easy to fall into, especially with kids who are really creative, really emotional, have a lot of depth and have a real hunger relationally. I think it just never is quite what they want. And so they perceive it as being left out. And so I think backing up and either making sure you have opportunities to watch them with other kids or fact checking with somebody else. I mean, I I wish those parents would have called me first and said, hey, tell me what's going on with my daughter at group or checking with the teacher or the school counselor, doing a little homework yourself because when we're falling for that perspective rather than reality, I don't think we're helping them at all. And so I think before we even think about what to do about them being left out, we want to back up and make sure that's really what's happening. And it's not their perspective because good grief to help them shift and get to more reality is only going to serve them well for the rest of their lives relationally. Are, are you talking to me about my childhood? <laughs> <laughs> is this an attack on the force? I'm just... Emotional depth and feeling excluded and it's never enough. 
I'm just saying. No, it's fine. <laughs> Heather, I, really, I will say a lot of them are forced. Uh-huh, I know. I know. I'm just saying. I get it. I get it. Well, I'm clear. Well, I'm clear. My reality, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> does translate into People, adulthood. We're really including you. We like you so much. We like to hang out. It with makes you. me feel like I must not be that bad because David and Sissy like me. Mm. Literally. <laughs> like as we I'm like launching you. this book, I'm like, I can launch this book because David and Sissy <laughs> like me. No, I, I think this is right. And I, I have both ends. I have all the ends of the spectrum on friends and navigating. And I, I just have a boy's perspective, but it still is complex. Maybe I know girls are but it's still complex and sure. I can report back. Yeah. Some of my boys that are included, if I say, Hey, why, why is so-and-so not a part of that? And he's like, we invite him all the time and he doesn't want to be included or he, we ask him to eat with us and he doesn't want to. And then, you know, my other son's like, I'm never included. And I'm like, well, who do you want to be friends with? It's like, you don't have to be a part of that group. Who do you want to be friends with? So how do we help them? With that, instead of seeing where they where they are not included, to have eyes and confidence and be a friend, so they have their own people. How do we help them with that? I was thinking, Heather, as as you were even giving that example, I love that the conversation involved a question. I love that you asked that question, like, "Who do you want to be with?" And you know, we believe strongly in the wisdom of asking good open-ended questions that I think speaks to what Sissy just said. It allows us to get more perspective. We're getting a bigger picture. There just are a lot of layers that I think can come from the wisdom. It, I think even back to what you all were speaking to a little bit earlier, lets us keep in check. Could it be that they're not as upset about it as I am? So all of the question asking piece, I think is a great thermometer to the larger situation. I would then say, after we've done some assessing in that space, we have a, a book called Are My Kids on Track, where we break down four emotional, four social, and four spiritual milestones we want to see kids moving toward. And the four social milestones, which is the middle part of the book, the first of the four is a milestone we call awareness. And there was a reason we put that one first, not in the middle or last, that I think <laughs> all social development needs to start with assessing my contribution. Like, what do I bring to the table? What's true about me? What do I know? What do I not know about myself that I need to? And we talk about, you know, within each of the social milestones, the differences in boys and girls. And generally speaking, there are certainly exceptions to every rule, but generally speaking, boys have less awareness and, and girls have more. And so I think when I go back to the whole idea of coaching, not fixing, I would say start to finish. I think boys require more social coaching. Now, I don't think that's that girls don't, since he's going to speak to where those needs are evident and significant. But it is to say, I think so much of a boy's development is more clumsy than clean. And so it's not that he can't do it. He just needs a bit more practice in that space. And so, you know, I think it's why the research would tell us with toddler age boys, they tend to stand too close, talk too loud, you know, like they have less awareness about boundaries and personal space, volume, tone, proximity, all those things. And I, I think the same is true all the way through to adolescent boys. You know, I had a mom tell me a story recently of they were home on a Friday night and she was like, you know what, let's, let's not cook. Let's order out. And their teenage son, who's 15, she's like, let's let him pick tonight. So she yelled up the stairs like, Hey, Jeff. And he goes, what? And she, <laughs> and she was like, Oh my goodness, I was just going to ask, where would you love to order from tonight? You're going to get to pick the restaurant. And he said, and I believe probably was genuine and saying, like, I just said, what? You know, and I think in his head, as in the case with many adolescent boys, so unaware of execution, the way toddler age boys are aware, unaware of volume and space and proximity, thought he was just, you know, probably saying, what, mom? And the delivery was so off, more clumsy than clean. So I think that aware in the awareness chapter, we talk a lot about helping just tools for helping kids build more awareness where they're not aware of how other people are experiencing them, which I think is kind of the sex, second stopping off point in terms of the very question you asked. Sissy, would you add anything to that? Just that I think girls are too aware. Yeah. I mean, and I think one of the things, you know, Heather, 
we, I think you know this about us, but at Daystar, we have individual counseling, group counseling, we do parent consults, and then we have this summer retreat program called Hope yeah. Town that I'm the director of. So I lived with second through 12th graders for seven weeks this summer. I'm still recovering from that. But I mean, I saw, it was so interesting to sit with kids and and I, I think we have been talking about how the anxiety rates are skyrocketing, how the depression is getting more significant. And I just sat with them in it. And I would say one thing in particular is the social anxiety is so much higher. And so that sense that they have in adolescence of self-consciousness that just hits them like a ton of bricks, it was, I mean, I don't even know how many volume notches that was turned up. I mean, they just were had disappeared behind their little faces. And so the idea of awareness, I think they're so aware right now that they're not even putting themselves out there, so many kids. And so it feels really important, not just to practice, I mean, a practicing awareness, but another milestone's reciprocity and mm. teaching kids, not even just how to stop talking. Used to, I would have leaned more on that end of they need to stop so the other person can respond. Now I would say they need to, we talk about it being like tennis, they need to launch the ball and mm. ask a question or respond to somebody else. So teaching a lot of those skills, I think, is one way to help. But the other thing I would say, and and you said this, they get locked into that group. And I think as soon as girls learn the social hierarchy, they put their eyes on that one group. And they're so aware of where those girls are on the playground, how they're engaging with them, what they're doing. And now, of course, with social media, they're more aware than they've ever been Awful. and of being left out. And, and I think helping them shift their eyes to the other really fabulous girls in their class. I mean, I say to girls a lot, this is very inside information and it kind of sounds terrible, but I'll say, you don't, you don't really want to be friends with the popular girls. They're not that nice. You want to find the group that's the next notch down from the popular girls and they're the best kind of friends you can find. But, but I, I will never forget a mom her daughter was doing this very thing. She was a seventh grader. And she only wanted to be friends with that group. And her mom said, there's so many neat girls in your grade. And the girl said, I just don't even know who they are. Mm -hmm. And so I had her bring her yearbook into a counseling session. And mm -hmm. she identified about six girls she wanted to be friends with. And so every night before school, she and her mom would sit down. She'd pick one friend and her mom would pray as she thought about it during the next day for her connection with that friend. And she would intentionally come up with a question to go ask that little girl. And they, she tried on different friends and found some new friendships. But I love that her mom was in her corner, quietly behind the scenes, praying like that so specifically and purposefully. And so I think helping widen their perspective, who do you want to be friends with? I mean, I, I just think that's such a phenomenal question. Mm. That's so good. What do you do if your child's the mean kid, and this can apply to the three-year-old who's biting, <laughs> I've had that one, and it's like you're talking to the mom and then all of a sudden a kid walks in bleeding and you're like, oh, that's that's because of my child. Or you, they get kicked <laughs> out of Mother's Day out for biting or whatever it is, and or up to you're hearing that they said something really unkind and maybe unintentionally because they lacked that awareness you're talking about, David, or... Um, maybe they just really are mean and you didn't know that your child is the bully. How do you navigate those waters? I feel like we would have totally different responses based on boys and girls. Yeah. What would you say, David? We very well may. I would say with boys, going back to even the story I just told, think about the version of that on a toddler, on an elementary age boy. I always think it's safe to start. We may not end there, but to start at a place of assuming that lack of awareness is playing some role. Like he's not aware that he's standing too close. He's not aware that he's hugging too tight. He's not aware that when he's frustrated, the teeth come out in those moments. That's not saying we're going to let him off the hook with that, but we are going to start from a place of assuming he needs some practice. And we talk all throughout that book about how practice makes progress. It doesn't make perfection, it makes progress. And generally speaking, boys just need a lot more practice in that space. And so I, I don't think it benefits any boy for us to go straight to a place of assuming his intention is to be mean or he's a lifelong biter. Or, you know, he's the he's the rough kid. He's the however we'd want to finish that sentence. But assuming he needs some practice, he doesn't have enough awareness. I think that's the starting point. 
And then I talk in the awareness chapter about the whole concept with boys of game day footage, like how often coaches have players come back on a Saturday and watch footage of the Friday night game. And, you know, think about that for a minute. Why does it benefit anyone to rewatch a game you've already played? You can't change the outcome. Can't make it any different. But we can, back to Sissy's point, develop some perspective. And we get to see things from a different angle. When I'm watching where the, you know, play was shot, I'm going to see something that I could not see on the field right there in the middle of it. And I believe in that practice with boys socially. Like, I think it's great not to do it when they're not aware, but to ahead of time say, you know, that whole thing that coaches do a lot. I want us to do some of that to help you build some awareness. Like, I've had countless coaches recommended that to players of the year. Like, let's watch it together. Let's see what we can learn. Let's try and pick up some things we may not, you, even I may not have seen watching the game so closely. And I think that's beneficial. And, you know, at a birthday party, you're just going to look like you're snapping photos of what's going on, but you could be videoing some interactions that you could later go back and watch with them. Like, hey, buddy, look right here. Did you see that your friend was stepping a little bit away from you? I think you were standing too close. You know, I think you were maybe shouting right there at that moment, like, watching for that you could flip on just the audio version when you're carpooling a group of guys in the car and then re-listen to a little of that footage at some point later for his growth and benefit not for the sake of judging and shaming obviously but you know like let's listen together and see what we can see now i will say last thought there i don't believe it's so helpful with boys and this is not just true of this category but a lot of categories to say do you think that's a good idea <laughs> because I think most of them will say no. I have parents all the time say to their adolescent, which, don't you think it'd be a good idea to go to counseling? To which 99.9% .9 of them say, no, I do not. Like, you're <laughs> welcome to go. I'm glad it helps you, mom, but no. So I think there are a lot of things where it's like, don't ask, do you think that would help? Just say, yeah, I think it would help. I think yeah. there's a reason coaches do that. Yeah, that's really good. Well, I think girls lean kind of two different ways when we see them being unkind to others. And one are the girls who maybe value competition over connection, and they are looking for a little bit more power. They are kind of quintessential mean girls. I mean, they're the most powerful girl in the group. And with those kids, I think you can see it start early. And so with them, I mean, a few things I would think about, they're just... They're valuing power over empathy in those times. And so putting them in some places early on where they're having to build more empathy. I mean, even common sense media has great games to help kids develop empathy. I would say those kids need to be serving somewhere in the community. They need to be in places that they're not going to succeed. They need to have to practice being average. I mean, all of those things I think are good for that girl to help her develop more awareness, more empathy, all of those things, more vulnerability, because she's trying hard not to have that. I remember, I remember a high school girl saying to me, who was that classic girl saying to me, the closer I get to Jesus, the less well I treat other people. <laughs> like that doesn't even make sense. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about, but <laughs> that sounds like something they say didn't... in Nashville. I don't know. <laughs> very Nashville thing. <laughs> Maybe Dallas yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I, I mean, so I think she was so full of herself. She felt like it was fine <laughs> that she treated people worse. So anyway, I think okay. with that one, we want to help them have a little humility, yeah. bottom line. The other thing that I see really happen with girls that I think we miss sometimes, you know, David talks at length about how impulsive boys are, aggressive boys are, and especially with attention hurdles, we see that come out. Whereas girls have this fascinating thing where you know, they really, number one, reserve their most negative emotions for home. Number two, they want to please typically the teacher. They want to look good in front of their classmates unless they're wanting to be powerful. And so girls with ADHD often fly below the radar because they can hold it together during the school day. They're not going to blurt things out in class the way a boy might who's struggling. And so what I see happen with girls with ADHD is they do kind of what David was describing with toddler age boys. They talk too loud and they stand too close and they say things that are too strong and they just don't have that social awareness. And, you know, as women, I mean, Heather, you and I know, there's this whole conversation that takes place here, but there's one that's going on beneath the surface. Yeah. 
Yeah. And girls, and, and that's, that starts so early and girls with ADHD start to miss that. They start to miss those social cues. And so those girls start to get left behind by other girls. And they're the ones who end up playing on the playground with boys when they're younger. And then the older they get, they say, I'd rather hang out with boys because they're just easier. And, and they are easier. They're simpler to communicate with than girls. And so I think we also want to be aware if there's more to the story and something deeper going on for her that's causing her to struggle relationally and to push other kids away because it likely might be what's going on. Do they start to pick up on the fact that that this is an issue and there's anxiety around that too? Like they're missing those cues. They're kind of aware that they're missing the cues. They don't know how to pick up on them. Does anxiety yes, kind some of start? girls definitely. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And those two occur together so often. Mm. Yeah, they definitely can. I don't know about y'all, but it feels like we're both excited that things are really picking up this fall and also a bit overwhelmed because there's less and less bandwidth for doing things like grocery shopping and meal planning, and I am launching a book. There's that. So I'm really thankful for companies like HelloFresh. They make it so much easier to have a meal plan, get food on the table, because our schedule does allow us to eat dinners together. It's just a little bit stressful to gather the food and plan it and chop it and cook it. Uh, so if I can take three of those four things and hand them over to HelloFresh, it's super helpful. The food comes right to me and I'm not wasting anything. It's actually 30% cheaper than going shopping at the grocery store. It already has the pre-portioned ingredients. It's family friendly. So my boys have enjoyed every meal I've made from HelloFresh, which isn't true for all food prep programs. Uh, I have also loved that, like I've told you, when they come in the kitchen, they're like, what's for dinner? As everybody's starting to get hungry and they're smelling things, I can just hold up the picture from HelloFresh and point to it and say, this is what we're eating. Um, if you want to check them out, go to HelloFresh.com slash DMA14. Use the code DMA for Don't Mom Alone, DMA14 for up to 14 free meals. Y'all, free food I want to give you, plus free shipping. So go to HelloFresh.com slash DMA14. Use the code DMA14. Get those 14 free meals and free shipping. And then you can find out for yourself why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Okay. A couple questions we've gotten that um, are a little more specific. One is if there's been a lot of moving around with the pandemic. So people may be moving closer to family now that they've realized, oh, wait, we didn't get to see you for a year and a half. And we really value those relationships or job changes that have been happening. And so being the new kid and then also the people being left behind. So if your child had a really close friend and they moved away and they're now like walling up because that pain of losing their friend is a new thing and they don't want to take that risk again and get close to someone. So there's two, um, two ends of the spectrum there, but this whole moving and shifting, and maybe it's not like you're the mean kid or you're struggling in general. It's just, you're new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say a first thought I had in response to that is this even fits with a little of what we are talking about on the front side of our conversation of how different kids have different needs relationally. I'd go right back to what we discussed about being aware that, um, if you were ever the new kid yourself, that experience for your kids is going to trigger a lot in you. And how you navigated that may be very different than how your kids do or need to navigate that too. And so pay a lot of attention to not putting your experience on them in that and knowing that their pace of moving into developing relationships as a new kid just may be very different based on your kid's temperament. And so you know, we were talking a little Enneagram a few minutes ago. I think generally speaking, you know, kids who are in what we call a withdrawing stance, more fours, fives, and nines, they're going to move very slow in entering into that space, generally speaking. And I think kids who are in the aggressive stance, three, sevens, and eights, they may have their foot slammed on the accelerator, you know, and be ready to host an overnight on week one. One's not right and one's not wrong. It's just different ways of seeing and experiencing the world. So I think the end advice or, or challenge there would just be 
Keep studying your kids. We talk so much about keep studying your kids, praying for more wisdom, believing God's going to give that to you, a more understanding and wisdom about the unique way they're hardwired and how they would navigate that. I would say on the flip side of losing friends uh, or losing a friend who may have moved or relocated, as painful as that's going to be to watch and where that may create some hesitancy or even as you shared resistance, use that as opportunity. I mean, I think one of the greater task of parenting is preparing our kids to navigate loss, loss of all kinds, you know, that is inevitable, the side of heaven. And so though none of us would script that into the kids we love stories, we have to be about the work of preparing them for loss, loss of friendships, loss of relationships, loss of jobs, loss of people we love in this world, because that loss is universal. It's a universal human experience that none of us can get around. And so I would take advantage of that and just even helping kids develop more of a connection emotionally to what's going on that may be affecting what's going on socially. We talk a lot about that in the book too, of there's a reason we did the emotional milestones before the social milestones too, that a lot of our kids hurdles socially are as rooted in their emotional struggles as they are in their social struggles. Sometimes we see it just as, you know, back to the example Sissy shared a little bit earlier. I can't tell you often I've had moms of boys be like, you know, he just hasn't had good friends. He hasn't met the right friend. He doesn't have good boys in his class. And I've spent time with some of those boys and thought to myself, no, I don't think he hasn't met the right friend yet. I don't think he knows how to be the right friend. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. he Ooh. is aggressive in the way he relates and dysregulated. And, you know, a lot of things going on emotionally that I think are getting in the way of this kid being all of who he can be socially. And I think, you know, those as a society, grief is not something we often give words to, but I think we're doing better with all that we've been through and more people are talking about loss and like grief. We always associated with um, death instead of grief of a loss of a friend or a loss of a job or grief of just an, a hope and an ideal. And so using those words, like, man, that, that must've caused a lot of pain for you and yes. sadness. And so it doesn't come out sideways as anger. And like you said, push friends away because you are that aggressive, angry voice. And so Sissy, I don't know if you have words for that, but I'd, I'd love to then get into how helping them be the kind of friend. So, mm -hmm. yeah. well, yes. I, and one of my favorite books, even based on what y'all are talking about is the invisible string. I don't know if you've read that Heather, but I love it. And I love it for loss of all kinds with ki of kids, but it's about the string that connects all of us. And so I will often have kids who either are having some separation anxiety and being away from mom or dad at school, or even moving to different spots and they can make, you know, those little bracelets from that we would wear in the eighties are back. And so yeah. making yeah. one of those little bracelets and sending it to their friend who lives far away as a way to connect them symbolically. I think kids emotions are so rooted often in tangible things, practical things that that can be a really cool transitional object as they're processing the loss. And I think that book gives great words to what it's like for them. The, the thing I would add as far as building new friendships for girls, particularly, I think girls can <laughs> fall victim to really high expectations. I mean, I have girls just changing schools all the time who will say, I had no friends, so I'm leaving my school and going to a new one. And then I think they have every expectation that they're going to walk into the school and it's going to be like a movie day one, and they're going to have a million best friends and it's be so easy. And so helping them manage those expectations and set expectations low. I think even if you have kids going to college, it's going to take some time to make friends. Let's say it's going to take a semester to make some good friends. And in the meantime, we're going to do a lot of fun things and we're going to have kids over and we're going to try on a lot of friendships because that's what it's going to take. And in the meantime, which is the other thing I would say in that process, you will participate in some group oriented activity whether it's sports, whether it's an art class, whether it's the school play, but we're going to find some place for you to plug in to help you find your people because it is so important for you to find your people. And especially if you have one who might hang back on those Enneagram numbers, as David said, I think helping them, helping facilitate it for them, younger, older, I think you could even say you get to pick, but you're going to participate in something every semester. You, you tell me what you want it to be. So to give your example, because I do think there's lots of people switching schools thinking that's going to fix the problem. 
how can we as moms and dads, I know their dad's listening, but how can we parent to help them be a kind friend? I know we've talked about the awareness pa- aspect for boys and just kind of coaching, but I don't know. I feel like this is so hard <laughs> because there's still people out there and I could tell them all the things, but in the moment, their flesh is their flesh. They're going to do what they're going to do and be their own people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I went to a continuing education full day seminar on girls and friendships, which was so interesting and helpful. And, and she did two things that I thought were awesome. One was she talked about friendship ingredients, it being like a recipe. And so again, they do so well concretely. And so helping girls come up with what are the lists of things that really go into being a good friend and even to take it a step further where do you feel like you lean kind of that you have more natural strength and what do you feel like you need to develop? And then let's talk about what we're looking for. I think can be a really practical approach. The other thing that I thought was really fascinating was there was this bullseye with, you know, strangers, acquaintances, friends, and best friends. And she talked about how girls put best friend expectations on acquaintances. Not interesting and so incredibly true. And so I think part of being a good friend is being aware of these are the things you can ask somebody who you don't know very well. This is what your friendship's going to be like. This is what it's going to be like when you're a really good friend. So I think both of those things practically, actually, let me add a third. So another thing that I love that a mom said one time in my office is she said, we're really talking to my daughter about having wait for me kinds of friends. She said, everybody wants someone who says, I'll wait for you. And it starts with being a wait for me kind of friend. So having concrete things like that, that we can talk with them about, I think can be really helpful for girls. David, what would you say for boys? Well, I, with the wait for me, what you're basically saying is I will set aside my comfort Mm. while you're in process. You know, I'm not going to run ahead to be with the popular kids for my social standing. It's interesting. My son is new to a new school, my high schooler. And last year was rough because it's a pandemic and he was at a new school and there just wasn't a lot of ways to get connected. He was on the football team. Anyway, long story short, his perspective on this hierarchy was he went to a party and he said, mom, everybody wants to try to have a conversation with the kids they know are popular. My objective that I've come up with is I find a kid just sitting by themselves. I sit with them and get to know them. I ask them questions and I'm like, you are a genius. I never would have thought of that. I'm like, where did you, I didn't teach you that. That is not something I taught you, but that is so smart to like, then you're expanding your knowledge base and getting to know lots of people and seeing if they're a match versus just putting all this energy into being liked by someone who could care less. They're not, they're not, their eyes are not for you right now. The the people at the top tier. So anyway, I thought that was very wise if someone's in that similar position if that's a concrete thing that you could give your kid to do at a social gathering or a party. Yeah. I love that. I I love love that that too. And something you spoke to and sharing that Heather, that I wanted to go back to in response to this question is you all talked a little bit earlier about girls, you know, chasing the popular girls. I think boys do the same thing. I call them charismatic characters. And I think that boys in two stages of development in particular, like the end of stage three, which would be roughly 11 to 12 and the beginning of stage four, which is kind of that 13 to 15 can stretch into 16 space. I think boys are doing a lot of chasing charismatic characters and it could happen before and it could happen after. But I think after boys develop more of a sense of kind of what they want in relationships, who their people are, where they're not doing as much of that. And generally speaking, I think the charismatic characters are the most athletic guy in the grade or the funniest guy. Like those are the two things that I think elevate a boy socially quicker than anything. And so I I sit with a lot of parents who are really worried about their sons doing that in that space in particular or at any point. And I'm always quick to draw attention to how normal that is developmentally and that I really do find it runs its course a lot of times if we let it. And even if he's giving a large amount of attention there, helping him turn some attention in other directions. And that would be another practical idea I would throw out of have him focus in on just one relationship to test drive. You know, the way we would test drive a car or even back to the college example, you know, one of the ways you figure out where you want to go to college is test driving schools, like going to visit, 
walking around, figuring out what you like and don't like. And that even if you go to a school you don't like, it was useful for the process of figuring out where you do want to go. If you spend time with a friend that you think, okay, those are not really the ingredients that I like so much in a person, or he was different than I experienced him in a group kind of thing. I think it had value, but I think boys tend to try to test drive six relationships at one time in a way where it just gets too confusing, but something about spending time one-on-one outside of school when that can happen that I think allows for that test driving differently, that I think is of great importance for boys, a practical thing I'd throw out. That's good. Okay. I feel like I need to ask two ends of the age spectrum questions. So I'm going to go young and then I'm going to go old since we just kind of talked old in this stage, which now seems so simple, but I remember being in it and it felt hard of navigating preschool years, early elementary. It just seems like kids are willing to be friends with anyone. And I think what was harder was maybe like a mom's rejection of my kid or this over helicopter parenting, their interactions. <laughs> like give sissy the toy. Oh no. Say please. Like we're (laughs) just let him play. Like, but I want to ask you, how do you coach? Well, in those little years, David, you want to jump in first? Yeah, but I'm going to, I'm going to preface it by saying, I don't think a lot of moms listening are going to love my answer to this, (laughs) but stay with me. Okay. Just stay with me. Go back to what I said a little bit earlier. I think it's always almost always more clumsy than clean. So one of my, uh, we'll start a good place. One of my favorite things about boys is generally speaking, their ability to navigate conflict in relationship and bounce back from conflict is extraordinary. Like when Sissy was talking about the layers of communication with girls, I love that about boys. There's really just one layer, you know, it's it's like that that classic marriage example, you know, where a husband's like, wait, you said you didn't want a gift for your anniversary. And she's like, well, of course I did. You know, it's like, well, if you did just say you did, you know, like tell them, just tell them. That's what I've learned. Just tell them. There's just one layer. And Mm -hmm. so I think boys out of that clumsiness can get really mad at friends. And y'all, I think even toddler age boys, I talk a lot about how they have a lot of physicality, their emotion when they're frustrated. Sometimes they growl at their friends. I have parents of preschoolers tell me that all like, he's like, it's like Roy Kent all over. Yes. (laughs) And Roy is just a toddler. It is like Roy Kent. Yeah. And then guess what? It's over and he's done. And he might come back to school the next day and hug the guy he growled at the day before. And I love that about boys. And so I don't know a lot of adult women who growl at people they're frustrated with, and that's okay. You don't need to, but know that if he does, it doesn't necessarily mean something's wrong or off and they may bounce back to a pretty extraordinary friendship the next day. So I, I think we do a lot of that policing you just described in ways that I don't think boys can execute that so successfully. And I think we don't understandably moms hear me say this. We don't feel satisfied or at ease with the way boys wrestle each other down, with the way they growl at each other, with how they're too physical, with how they yell, like, stop. And then the other boy's like, okay. You know, like that's the the way they execute a lot of those things. It's just more clumsy. And so certainly there's a place for intervening. Don't hear me saying that. And you've heard me say extensively, coaching is useful. But I think the way it looks is just going to it's it's not going to always execute the way we would hope or be as clean as we would imagine. And for the mom of the daughter that your son is playing with, give her some grace because the boys are clumsy. <laughs> They're going to be exactly. mean maybe to you and your daughter might cry and it's going to be okay. And don't yes. stop being friends with her. Because yes. yes. Like yes. if we, the mom, the moms of girls, if you could just hear that and this Mm. child is going to act differently than you grew up being, or that you would ever consider being. And it's not that the mom parented wrong and you can still hang out with her. I just need you to know that. That's all I got. Yes. All right. I only know a hundred percent. agree. (laughs) Well, I think with little girls, probably like so many things with girls, I want to figure out what's going on underneath the behavior, because I do think little girls lean towards making good friends. I mean, I think they just automatically know how to be kind a lot of times and are going to lean towards empathy with other kids. And so when they're not stepping out in 
relationship and in friendship, I think often there's something more to it. And typically this day and time, I would say it's anxiety or just worries. I don't mean we're diagnosing them with anxiety, but I think for those girls though, it's not helpful to step in and do exactly what you said. Now, I want you to go talk to this person. I want you to say that and let's practice what you're going to do here. Instead, I mean, I think even to reinforce behavior, you did so great when you spoke to Mrs. So-and-so when we were at the grocery store, or I heard you did awesome at school. And so let's go celebrate that you made a new friend at school today, that we're almost even incentivizing them reaching out past that anxiety. Because the thing is, kids who are anxious, well, all kids long to be independent and kids who are anxious really need to be independent. And so the more we're hovering and telling them exactly what to do, we're stripping them of that. And so to help kind of on the back end with reinforcing and incentivizing, I think can be really helpful for little girls. And if there's the little girl that in the play scenario, she kind of bosses everyone, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. She's Definitely. like future CEO and like a little body. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they're embarrassed. They're embarrassed because they're like, no one ever wants to play with her because she's always telling them what to do. And yeah, I might have. Yeah, I think with that little girl, we want to do some practicing for sure okay. and role playing with her. So she needs the basics of, I mean, I would say are my kids on track would be a book I would definitely recommend for that little girl because she just needs help with the pacing of relationship and awareness, all those things, all those things. Okay. My yeah. very last question and we got to go. They've got important things to do. People can keep them here forever um, is a teenage question when you're seeing your teen not like drawn towards the wrong crowd or befriending a kid that you know is making wrong choices and feeling like, oh my gosh, I know that friends influence you and I don't want my child. But also maybe there's this pull of, well, I know that child's mom and I know she would appreciate if her child had some positive influence. Like how do we not just leave kids behind who are making wrong choices, but also not let our kid become the collateral damage of that. Can I give a really practical answer first? Yes. And then David, you jump in. One idea is with adolescence, I think it is really easy to create a forbidden fruit scenario where we start saying, I feel concerned about that friend. I feel concerned about that person that you're interested in. You know, just that happens so quickly rather than like David talked about before us asking really good questions, or even we were, David and I were speaking together at a school once. And this mom said she had developed something in her house with all of her kids where they each had the right to say red light to someone else. And when they did, that meant I have some concerns about this friend for you or this boy you've brought home. And I'm not going to say any more than that unless you ask me, but I'm just going to say red light. And that was kind of a prompt for those kids and typically made them hungry for more information, but it wasn't us kind of throwing it, forcing it down their throat. And, and all that to say, I have had extreme situations where parents have to sever a friendship or a relationship for kids. And I think you want to do all the other things before you get to that place. And I would probably only do it with wise counsel, with a counselor who stepped in and helped me with that. David, what would you say about boys? Yeah, I love that practice to see introduced. And I've had families do that. And even building on a sister who has greater awareness, like we talked about, and a brother who doesn't, you know, having an older sister who throws out the red light at times and, and, can see something maybe he can't see. I would say two other things back to the charismatic character piece within that question, play the long game of parenting that sometimes there may be a lot of interest and a lot of attention in that space, simply because of what we talked about is going on developmentally that will run its course even three months later, six months later, a year later when he's in a different space developmentally until he gets there. I would turn your attention on what you can control and away from what you can't. So I, for example, practically, I talk a lot with parents about, you know, you ultimately, you can't control the kinds of people your son is interested in. You can control the amount of time he spends with them. You know, so if it's a friend where you think I had a, sat with a parent last week and the mom's like, I don't trust this kid. I've heard a lot of other moms share some stories about him. And honestly, David, I don't trust his parents. Like, I don't think they're, it's good oversight. I worry they'd be the kind of parents that might serve alcohol and 
take up car keys and think that's enough. And I'm like, and you get to make that call. But I do, I would avoid doing a lot of he's bad for you. I've heard all these things, you know, just like speaking to the interest piece and let it be more about, you know, I understand you're really into him right now. You seem super curious. It's I'm great if you want to have him over to our house. I'm not comfortable with you going to his because I think his parents and I may have some different rules on oversight supervision, you know, and you're not criticizing the other parents. You're just saying we play the game differently. You're also not saying you can't see him. You can't spend time with him, but you can do it on my watch under my roof. And I think that's a better way. It also gives you the opportunity to observe a lot more too. Right. I think that's important because you could, it could be all gossip around this kid. Sure. And, and until you witness something, can you speak to the other parent and say, Hey, I've noticed. And instead of saying, did you know your son, blah, blah, blah. Like, Hey, it seems like so-and-so struggling. How can I come and support you? Like we're in this together. Mm, I love that. I've never parented a teen before. This is hard. And then it's like wheels off post pan. Like I'm not saying post pandemic. We're not post pandemic. We're still in it, but like they were all isolated and now they're like, it's the roaring twenties and we're going to party hard. And so (laughs) Alcohol is a thing in younger and younger kids. And so how do we navigate this together instead Mm of pitting me against you of like, you're a bad parent because you blah, blah, blah. Y'all are amazing. I think this was like the most unbelievable conversation I've ever had in my entire life. And you are gifts to the world. And I know you have things to do. So thank you so much. We put links to all the times you've been on before and where they can find you. And so- we are so grateful for your voice. We're so grateful for your friendship, Heather. Oh. We think you're a gift to the world oh. too, for sure. Yes. And this book yes. is going to yes. be, we can't wait to get our hands on it. You're so sweet. Well, appreciate you haven't, if you're listening right now and you haven't ordered her book, you need to get online right now. Yeah. That needs to happen. That's right. That's right. Tell him, David. That's right. You're the boss. <laughs> I know this is a uh, hot button topic and sensitive and, Maybe some things from your own story just kind of came to mind. And uh, I'm grieving with you. I am sad for your child if you are walking through any heartache related to relationships. And so I want to pray over us. And then I just have a few things to tell you about. Lord, I know community and walking along one another is so important. And I know that each of these kids are in process. They are just like we are in process, sorting through how you wired them, giving them good strategies for how they navigate life. And I pray, Lord, that as parents, we would come to you with the truth of the gospel, that we are not going to get it right in our own, that we need Jesus so desperately, that none of us are perfect. And whether we are in the cool crowd or we are being left out or we are bullying or we are being bullied, that we all need you, that you are the only one who can bring us the wholeness and the health and the Holy Spirit to give us the kind of fruit that is going to love people well, to put aside our own comforts and our own convenience and think of the other person. I pray Lord, that you would give parents discernment on how to coach well how to help keep their kids' eyes focused on being good friends instead of trying to earn the attention and approval of other people. I pray that they would find their worth and their value and their identity in you alone and that all of these relationships can be bonus to that. Thank you for David and Sissy. We pray that you would give them supernatural uh, strength and insight and wisdom as they guide so many children and families. We thank you for their time here and how they've helped us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, it's getting really close, y'all. Okay, we're only a few weeks out from my book launching, and we've already fired up the launch team. It is closed to new members, but you can still pre order the book. Go to don'tmomalone.com forward slash book. You can see it's sold everywhere, but if you fill out a form, you will start getting emails and you'll get a free audiobook when you pre order a copy of the book. I'm also sending out little 10-minute pep talks that cover uh, content from the book if you want a little sneak peek. And, you know, I've been working on some new merch. So that's exciting. Uh, Maybe a retro-styled tee to go with the Don't Mom Alone theme. I am really excited. I've been so blessed with very kind messages from each of y'all. And I will tell you one way 
if you want to think of one way you can help launch this book, it is to share a favorite episode that you've listened to or share a episode on social media or with a friend or with a friend group, a mom group. Y'all have been so kind this last week to tell me about how you are the best marketers. That's literally the only way (laughs) this show has grown because um, there's so many options out there for people and places they can get information, but they're going to trust you. You are a worthy and important marketer because your voice matters to that person. And they're going to trust you way over some sort of sponsored post I can put on the internet. So thank you so much for your confidence and for walking this road with me in all these eight years. Oh, my stars. And um, yeah, you know, here we go. Meet me back here next week. Uh, Jamie Ivey's coming on the show and it's a really, really, really good conversation that I think it's going to encourage all of y'all. So see you next week. Adios. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Don't Mom Alone podcast. If you're wanting to connect with more people and more resources to help remind you that you're not alone, head over to don'tmomalone.com. That's where you'll also find show notes with any links mentioned by our guests. Most importantly, I want you to know the good news, the great news that you're not alone because God has promised to always be with you. With faith in Jesus Christ, the one who died for you and rose again, Jesus said when he left, he was going to leave a helper, a comforter to be with us. God in us. Moms, that's superpower. So while you're washing dishes at your kitchen sink, while you're driving to and from work, while you're feeding that baby late into the night, while you're cleaning sticky floors, God promises to be just as present with you as when you're worshiping in a church pew. As it says in Zephaniah 317, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. Now that's good news. Have a great day.